Yeah, because there is a letter we've got somewhere from off Gem, isn't it? Recommending changes to the wine regs. <clears throat> yeah, off Gem wrote to be a, to the uh, IET council and asked them to change um, stuff. Oh, look. I'm sure it's just titled off Gem letter or something. Uh, nothing comes up from off Gem with a search. Oh, yes, it does. Hang on. Off Gem G12 four letter. That's it. And they asked to change some bits in the wine regs and special occasions. So they do have an influence and we can refer to that because that was publicly available. I had a row with someone over that because I think that letter said for them to change some earthing requirements or something. How in the hell do you remember all this stuff, dude? Um, I'm diverse and inclusive in my application of my knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Everybody and welcome to the E5 podcast. I am Paul Meenan. Thank you very much for joining us today. And I am joined by some people that I genuinely cherish, love and respect. Um, introduce yourself, chaps. Hello, I'm JW. And it's Dave Watts here, Sparky Ninja. There we go. The wise man and the ninja trainer. So we are today going to talk about something um, that we were, and, and just before we start this, we're not that boring, okay? I've just been to a convention this weekend, so I genuinely am not that boring, okay? Um, but we're going to talk about industry regulation, industry oversight, and just general regulations. Um, somebody on Instagram messaged us and asked us to do this podcast to talk about mm -hmm. the whole so, yeah. mixed bag of stuff. That's so, right, so, so blame them. So blame them, don't blame us, and if there's any benefit. But what we thought we'd do is we'd talk about the, the fact that the electrical industry is and isn't regulated, and we'll explore that, but we will cover electricity work regs, ESQCR, um, the uh, electrical safety standards and private renting sector, Part P, Consumer Rights Act, and that consumer protection of, of unfair trading that we mentioned in a previous podcast. And we'll also talk about off gem, mm -hmm. just but, to, but, to wet your whistle. But, but gently. Gently. Shall we begin? Right. So I'm going to ask you chaps a question. Yes, mate. Who regulates the electrical industry? Um, <laughs> a bit leading, well, isn't it? Yeah. Well, there's lots of organisations that think they can, but they don't. Or at least mm. they don't in any particular way. And then there's ones that used to, and now they don't anymore. So uh, it's all a bit of a mess, really. Interesting you say that, because that's exactly right. So let, let's get to the, to, to the meat in the sandwich straight away. So everybody listening to this will immediately go NIC or ECA or NAPIT. Um, they're the industry okay. regulators, the watchdogs. They're not technically. They are officially private for profit organisations and they have different, I suppose, branding. So NAPIT, obviously a trade association. Um, the NIC, I don't actually know what the NIC are anymore. They used to be the National Inspection Council for Electrical Installation Contracting. They're now a marketing brand. Um, the ECA are Electrical Contract Association. They're also a trade association. And if you know anything about their marketing, it's about getting you specified. And the ECA hmm. have a, a quite pyramidical type. Uh, they're the largest of the industry bodies. They kind of fund and have underneath their brand in some financial way the NIC, the JIB, and various other parts of the industry. Um, so they are the biggest uh, in the industry, but they don't regulate it. Is that fair to say, chaps? Yeah, yeah they have group companies, which on their website, yep. uh, Blue Sky Pensions, JIB, JTL Training, Search Shore, which is NIC, and ECIS. And then they have industry partners, uh, BASEC, BCIA, BEMA. BSRIA or BRISRI as I call it, SIBC, uh, NICIC, SELECT, TESP, Voltimum, um, Gambica, IAT. And so there's some big, big names in this. Big, big change, you know, game ch get, uh, players in this industry. Yeah. Are partners with it. I think it's fair to say that when, and I do love this because occasionally the, the industry bodies will use professional electrician or Voltimum or some of those excellent mm -hmm. information giving partners to um, inform electricians and I do love it when we see statements that says 
we have worked with the industry and when you look at the list of people they're all eca subsidiary companies and you're like no you haven't you've basically just sat in a room with the people that you own and told them this is what we're doing put all your different badges and logos to it and gone yeah well we're all deemed in different parts of the industry so it's a collaboration no it's not it's like me going downstairs to my IT department and saying, you're IT, but I'm going to rebrand you as something else and you're going to support what I'm doing. Well, of course, they're all part of the same umbrella at the end of the day. They're all going to do what they're told. It's yes. And, uh, a bit of a and, false economy. Yeah. And whilst there will be probably individual structures with these different sections, there definitely will be um, strategies in place that benefit each other. Um, well, let's be honest about it. The NIC are not not going to do what they're told by the ECA. No. Um, it, it's fairly, and then if you look at stuff, uh, and I'll dig out the information while you guys are talking. If you look at Electrical Safety First, which are a registered charity, mm. the majority of their funding comes from uh, the NIC EIC. So they're not exactly going to sit and go, do you know what, to improve this industry, the industry bodies need to get their finger out and start licensing yeah. and doing more and notifying people which, of what is a dangerous <clears throat> electrician. Don't do that. It goes against mm. the the financial uh, agenda of of another part of the industry which does which does kind of serve the problem as to we know we know where some of the biggest problems in the industry has come from in the past 10 15 years i mean i put an awful lot of my attention to training and a lot of my attention to how that training then re relates to authorization or access to our industry and the way that's been adjusted to suit the beneficiaries and we know where those little boundaries are. We know where those gatekeepers are, but most of the persons who would rely on fixing the problem are in some way involved in those interests. Um, and it does create a problem. It, it's, there's, there's, it's very hard to find independence in the industry that acts for just, you know, the benefit of the industry itself. I guess, I mean, what would you define as the industry? Is it electricians or is it not electricians? I don't think you can define it at all because it's all, unfortunately, mm -hmm. when it's mentioned, it's usually a part of some other part which is connected to another part, and it's all sort of all mingled together in a confusing so and tangled if I mess. make if I make decisions for the industry, am I making decisions for the registration strategies, for the control, for the authorizations, for products, for manufacturing, or for electricians out there doing the work? You know. Quite often, one of them gets ignored, or two of them do. So, can I can I give you some absolute facts? So, while you've been talking, thank you. Mm -hmm. I have got the job description for the CEO role of Electrical Safety First. Um, okay. Just because I'm that sad, I, I actually was going to apply because everybody who knows me knows I'm chairman of the Electrical Safety Roundtable for Workplace. I bet you don't so. have to be an electrician though. Uh, it doesn't mention anything about that, but if you if you let me let just let me go into it and I'll 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 take you on a little journey, All right. um, because people will, will, will obviously immediately think we're trying to kick the e ECA the NIC. We're not, no, no, um, no. and we're not taking away that they all do good work for people and that the charitable trust do great work for people in need or anything like that. What mm -hmm. we're just trying to do is put the facts out there. So, I'm chairman of Electric Safety Round Table. I was actually going to apply when this job came up. And I didn't for a reason and, and in my personal reasons, but just just going off the role description. So the job purpose is to lead the continued development and implementation of the charities agreed strategy, which is what we're going to do to grow the charities influence and position um, and to deliver its plan and achieve its core objectives. That's fine. Um, it then says to ensure the charity's business interest and financial resources are managed efficiently because obviously it's a charity. Fair enough mm -hmm. to build partnerships and networks. Fine. This is to work with the trustees to ensure the board operates efficiently. That's all good stuff as far as the job purpose. Please note in the job purpose, I don't see anything about improving safety in the industry. It's all about company strategies. Now, yeah, no, so I'm it's sure, about pushing them down the road more. Yes, it's about building the, the, the brand. And our chief execs have got to build the awareness of their yeah, trust. Their but, job role, isn't it? But, but at the core should be, I care for safety. You don't want someone who's not caring about safety you because otherwise it's just a business and this is a charity now interestingly it then says dimensions that the the current employee levels are and i'm not going to read that out with an annual expenditure of of a few million let's just say um, the ceo is responsible for the charity senior leadership team and it talks about the leadership team but it then states quote 
the main funding for the charity is derived from gift aid from Searchshaw Limited Liability, a joint venture owned by the charity and the ECA. Okay, so basically you're getting all your funding from yourself and Searchshaw, which is a trading body that owns the NIC EIC. Um, and Searchshaw is also owned by ECA, who also in turn <coughs> own the NIC. Uh, it's just really confusing. Which does but, create a problem though, because we 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 want to use the electrical safety first as the as the body or the entity for um, improving. You know, if we if we see issues that, for example, if I see an issue that could affect the welfare of members of the public, I want to get I want them to work to improve that. Yep. Look at you know, look at things that even some some people in the IET have tried to do over some time. You, you know, look at like the fatally flawed uh, situation where you know even we put our names onto a, onto a letter. I think um, yep. David Peacock passed away unfortunately. You know, we'd like we'd like to be able to hand these things over, um, but it's a case of does it you know is that is anything that is pushed to try and improve the welfare of the public or anything going to first have to satisfy the expectations of their fund you know their, their, their funding sponsors, bodies their funding bodies yeah and, and but more importantly yeah, so if there's a section in the job description um mm -hmm. which says working with search or and it says three bullet points work closely with the esf's electrical safety first jv partner which is joint venture yeah. eca in brackets and trustees to ensure the charity's interest in the strategic and operational activities of Searchshore are appropriately represented. OK, uh, because basically the chief exec is supposed to sit on the board of um, Searchshore. And then it says represent the ESF on the management committee of Searchshore and its remuneration committee as required. Take the position as chair of the limited liability partnership. So whilst you're chair of electrical safety first, you're also going to be required to take the chair of the limited liability partnership called Searchshore. It all gets very confusing, doesn't it? Then it says ensure good channels of communication maintained with the ESS trading subsidiary, Searchshore. I'm really confused. So am I, am I chief exec of, of Electrical Safety First or am I the chief exec of Searchshore, which in part then owns the NIC and, and is jointly funded by the ECA and also their funding comes from the ECA. And to me, this is just one big circle of and believe it or not, when I read stuff like this, there's other stuff in this. I just went, I can't genuinely operate a charity independently uh. um, to do what I think is best for the industry. If I have a level of governance or control, which might cause an embarrassment to my chief partners. Now, don't get me wrong. Again, I'll say this. I'm not trying to bring the industry into disrepute. I'm not trying to sling each under the bus or search or anybody like that. But what I'm saying is, is if it's a charity and it's independent, it should be independent. As, but now, if, if I'm taking funding from the ECA, that's great. It's good to see. But I should not I should not have any influence potentially from them as to what I do to highlight this, because what I don't see from uh, industry regulation or oversight is no one in this industry says beware, beware, beware. And we'll come on to that, Dave, because recently it has happened um, with with one part of the industry that you're very uh, you've pulled some of your hair out over, to say the least. <laughs> so our parts of the industry is, are starting to level up and start yeah. challenging. And, 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 and But I have always said for many, many years to the NIC direct, their directors and the ECA, you need to do more to challenge the road traders, to inform the public about safety matters, to challenge the manufacturers and to do as much as you can to share this knowledge. So we're basically kicking doors in the screen from the top of your head. Every month, I'd like to see Electrical Safety First have a column in Pro Electrician says this month, this is what we've done for electrical safety to keep electricians safe. These are the manufacturers we've had to wrap the knuckles off. These are the campaigns we're doing, you know, showing yeah. the industry I mean, we're trying to keep people safe. To be fair, we do see often now and then um, the release about a product that's been recalled. Um, yeah, and they do in fairness have a website yeah. where you can go and look at recalls. It's just not advertised, and I, it's not I don't understand why we we're not advertising enough. And I don't think they're on. Are they on Twitter and LinkedIn? They and they, they are. They are. They um, are. Okay, fine. They, That's just me not on it. Sorry. No, they they they've done some uh, video campaigns to try and improve like safety in the home. But again, if you want to improve, you know, if you want to try and improve your safety in the home, they need to do a bit more than that. I'd want to see them pushing towards providing a much more you know accessible resource to members of the public 
uh, even maybe going so far as to helping talk about electrical safety in schools and so forth. They have yep. uh, part of their website. I mean, I had someone, um, another tutor ask me about it. Or, or No, not a tutor, a guy who's going to do talking, I think, at a brownies thing or a scouts thing. And I said, well, look, check this out. And they do have, I think it's called Switched On Kids or something. Great. Um, they have um, that. And it's okay. It's, yeah, I mean, they it's, are. But it's they, an effort. It's an effort. And for something that, someone that takes ownership of this safety as their 100% priority, or maybe 90% priority, I just would expect more to be carried on, more to be delivered, more to be offered. Yeah, than, than that one thing that we then keep, you know, keeps getting reshared. Given the know. budgets that they have, I would expect more from them because we're now in a time where electrical safety accident statistics and fires mm. and everything are becoming more prevalent. I don't see on my day to day more from them, and that yeah. that to me is a disappointment. But just just to let you know as well, in the job description, the experience does not require you to be electrical qualified in any way. It right. requires strategic acumen you know, negotiating skills, all that good sort of stuff expected of a CEO. Skills and abilities, not really, no, nothing electrical. But in, in the last bullet point, the knowledge sector, it says ideally knowledge of electrical and safety issues. So it's basically nice to have. Nice um, to have. But okay. I personally think that that should have been that the, we need someone experienced in the electrical industry to lead mm. something so like the, this. The role, the role is to obviously keep it growing, keep it moving forward, keep it strengthening, and they have their own technical people that they will but rely you, on for the, you the could electrical argue, bit. But you could, yeah, and this is the thing. If this is more of a growth role than it is. Mm. I, I just, when I saw that, I just went, no, I'm not applying for it because I didn't agree with that because if you build it, they will come. And I think... It was me more about an electrical person leading an electrical industry body because let's be honest about it. If you know what you know, people will listen more. Um, and I just think there's too much of that politics and that commercial application. And I, and I understand they're a charity, but they're pretty well funded by their partners, um, to be perfectly frank. So I, I just didn't like the way it sat with me. And again, it's not a besmirchment on electrical safety first or anything like that, but they, they've done some great work, but I, I would love it. And this is me saying, please do more. And I'm yes. chairman of the Electrical Safety Roundtable, and I'm desperately trying to do mm -hmm. more with the Electrical Safety Roundtable to raise yeah. the profile of electrical safety. And that's that's probably where this is more coming from, my frustration that they don't have more coming, more, more, because they have got some good resource. We've seen some, um, yeah. but we probably would like more. We'd like that to well, be a good funnel of safety. We'd love, I'd love to point members of the public to it. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm you doing... Know? I'm, I've just had my latest electrical safety round table and we've got lots and lots and lots of ideas that was generated in our lots meet, last meeting. So we'll be producing lots of bespoke things. We're going to produce, we've got some ideas that have never been put forward um, and we're going to do that. And hopefully also we'll be writing as well, doing some research and mm -hmm. writing some letters to government to try and get them to wake up out of their coma um, and try and improve things. Now, speaking of government, Dave, mm -hmm. if we go back to the E5 originals, you know who I'm talking about here. Mm -hmm. um, Papa Watts and the likes. Part mm -hmm. P. Yeah. Do you think that effectively regulates or governs our industry? No. no. Um, it, it's use, Putting it in the building regulation clearly puts it in a point of some level of statutory control, but doesn't regulate. And fundamentally, it was handed over to a a and the, the you know the um what is it is it the ministry of housing communities local government or yeah. have they changed their name to leveling up now i saw something on twitter oh you're joking they're they've, not calling themselves leveling up are they please they, they, don't say i don't that. know i saw it on twitter that they were putting some leveling up into their name to kind of to do it post post covid i don't know if that's a full-time thing or a temporary thing but anyway the point was that they obviously rely heavily on things like competent person schemes to then, you, you know, through UCAS accreditation to quality assure, monitor, control or whatever, the assurance of competent person schemes. Do competent person schemes work? I mean, competent person schemes aren't exclusive to the electrical industry. You know, they work in a number of other services and the government seems to have considered that this is the easiest and the most effective way to assure control of delivery of a legislation. Now, the legislation itself, um, I I think it was a good idea to kind of control that type of work in that environment, but um, doesn't regulate the our industry overall. And the legislation itself 
has good intention, but we've seen through the how many years has it been in effect now? Uh, 2005, was 2005, it like, 2005 yeah, just nearly 20, 20 years. Mm-hmm. Nearly, we've seen a few versions of it, they've played yeah. around with it. They have, they removed so, the scope, the didn't suit, they? And... Yeah, but why is it because it was too hard or yeah. it didn't create the right opportunities? You know, why play around with that? I um, think one, so I'm not convinced with it. One of our one of our dear friends, Lee Ward, as well, he had he was down in Dorset, he was doing a lot of um. Uh, building regulations inspections of other contractors work and he was mm. he would tell us horror stories and uh, it's like with the building regulations everything is effectively down to the the competence of the inspector not the Indeed. um the operation of the business or the entity um because they just deal with legal eagles um and yeah he was he would find some horrific stuff which building control would then sign off even though he would tell him it's horrific um, but it'll be all that. Yeah, we're all mates. La, la, la. It was it was very bad. It was very poor behavior. He I, saw, and I, I hope he's well if he's listening to, as well. I ex- I experienced the same when I w- I lived in the um in Berkshire. I had, we had the same thing. We had we had uh, the new part P came out, and we had local authorities that didn't know what to do about it, and we had work that was notifiable, and we contacted them, and they go, oh, because uh, we weren't registered. We said, no, no, you can do it the indirect way, uh, and we ended up helping them out getting to understand it and then they actually used us as a contractor for other for for checking out other contractors they just had no other way of controlling it it was like here's a salute here's a solution and they threw it at local authorities or building control which um wasn't in any way structured to control electrical competent checks and so they got outsourced um i think the problem with part p is it's always going to be considered as the change or the imp- the introduction or the identity of a domestic market and so it's always going to have that that um, that impact on the industry. We're going to think of Part P as the thing that created that that uh, splinter that fractured the industry into into two. I mean, there are many different types, you know, many different scopes of industry for electricians anyway. But it created that definite other foundation of domestic only training, which has a you know huge knock on effect with the access and the training uh, routes. Which uh, you know they're going to fix. The thing is, the principle of it, Dave, was not bad because the principle wasn't training, bad. Training specifically for the domestic sector could potentially, if you're an industrial partner like me, going into domestic. I wish there was domestic wiring courses that would teach me the because mm-hmm. I, I get loads of industrial sparks from years ago. Yeah, house bashing. Yeah, it's easy. It's piece of piss. It ain't really it's complex. Just, it's really difficult. It has yeah, its own unique challenges and skills required. It's the same with other tasks that people may may think aren't as complex as they really are. You know, take for example things like pad testing. If you're going to jump into pad testing, you go, "Ah, oh, it's a piece of cake." You know, push two buttons, do. But if you don't actually follow the code of practice, do the work properly and competently, it's quite a complex work. Mm. You know, and it's you know quite nice work. Just can't do it because no one actually will pay the right money for it, and everyone just will run through buildings and do them in seconds. Um, yeah, it's the same on. problem. And electricians training going on to the whole. You know the gold card and all this stuff they'd have the choice to whether work in domestic or industrial or commercial and they may create their little niche they may go down their certain little direction and stay there for a while or go there for career um but domestic was always an option they could always do a bit of domestic here and there but obviously the domestic route kind of just created this wedge for a lot of those i mean i know many guys who are you know who are who are fully qualified i say that loosely fully qualified i don't like that, that wording at all uh who are you know um <clears throat> Industry recognised as qualified electricians who wanted to just do domestics, and then they found themselves having to struggle and keep up because there's just so many other people. Um, and and as I said in many other podcasts, the, the the intent of Part P I think was good. I think it was necessary because the idea really was to protect people in their homes from doing yeah, dangerous things. Yeah, it's worth also noting as well you know, that when when Part P came out, I remember test equipment manufacturers selling equipment saying part p compliant which was just marketing yeah but what it did do as well was because i remember pre part p a a lot of people didn't have test equipment now if you look at pre part p say 99 2000 the amount of people who had access to multifunction testers compared to now it's chalk and cheese 1999 i worked for a contractor that had one bit of test kit for the whole company for all their sites that's your point, though. We'd have one pat tester with the company. We'd have one tester with the company. But then when you have the 17th edition and this new buzz about inspection, testing, certification, reporting, get your pads, do your carbon copies, buy your DVDs on training, 
add to that the fact that people could then become their own self-employed domestic electrician the boom in persons authorized into the industry the amount of registrations was up the amount of people buying testers was up the amount of people buying pads tools and everything was up the more people in the industry working at that capacity the better for everyone yep except electricians who found themselves now being flooded by a lot of people doing the same work who had a much lower level of experience and training behind them and, and it wasn't was their, the and it wasn't their fault which is something else we will cover which you covered this week talking uh, with Tom on um, fixed radio you know um it's not their fault a lot of these people that have come through this other route no it's not it's not you and know? it would be and it it's would up be... to the industry to help that yeah it's it, and and this is this is where the likes of electrical safety first and everybody's got has got a duty to help these people and support them and and all the rest of it john what's your thoughts on part p mate i think part p is like the idea was okay unfortunately because the way it was implemented it's led to a whole lot of things which simply don't work like these courses offered by certain training providers you've seen that word a bit uh not really quite training is it but uh where they've created courses and they're, they're actually advertising it to people and they're still doing it now whereas mm -hmm. uh, someone who's got zero experience and has never done anything electrical in the world and then you can go on this course for two months or three months or whatever and at the end of it you've got all your bits of paper and you can just go and do all this stuff and join a competent person scheme and magically it's all done but they're selling a lie and that's all come about because of part p and unfortunately there are people paying thousands and thousands of pounds for these courses and getting at the end of it and suddenly discovering that actually what they've been sold is just a load of old junk um so that part of it just doesn't work um and then there's this other myth about oh there's this big shortage of electricians well there's no shortage of people going on these courses but there's a shortage of people that can do the work properly yeah and those are two very different things yeah and that is uh, true and that is the kind of part which needs to go away completely and this whole and it is it's kind of moving along that road with a new specification where you're supposed to be mm. being doing it for two years and all this kind of thing which is in theory going to be applied and should be applied already and um, it is it's so, unfortunately yeah. unfortunately it's theoretical i'll just tip in and just say i was looking into some of this even yesterday with a another chap we found one training provider that's delivering the uh the old the old um the old level three qualification the in, in installation inspection testing of electrical installations in dwellings which was introduced around 2013 which was the idea of a portfolio based training strategy for people to enter the domestic sector via portfolio evidence like an mvq it was shelved at the time because cps and similar didn't take it on board as the only way in they carried on taking any other methods in the uh, quicker strategies. Now the AS tightened up, that's shut down, but now this qualification is coming back and they're now taking that as the minimum for their dwellings only registration. There's a company online delivering that course for £1,950 plus VAT in three weeks. But before you attend it, you have to have done the prior learning or your two years experience equivalents but they can do that in 22 days for two for nearly three grand so you're looking at three 22 three you're looking at six weeks six yeah. weeks and wow what an improvement about, about, extra about five weeks six weeks and about six grand six and six same same things we've always had but that now will get you through the requirements of one of the cps after the changes in the eas that we've had which we've been told yeah. have tightened all this up so we're now saying minimum of six weeks yeah, I have obviously wow. spoken to some people. This is being heavily looked into right now. Okay. It's, you know, and the, yeah. unfortunately, this is the problem. When they try to improve or tighten up the entry, those in control of that will try to find a way around it, try to find the easiest, the quickest, the simplest way. That we're, we're even talking now about things like, you know, um, top loading or front loading, where we're going to train people on like a, you know, the outcomes of like a 2365 which I used to do this course, right? People are saying we have to because there's no solutions for people who are, you know, adults with kids at home and they have to work. They have to go to college for six weeks. No, they don't. I used to train them two evenings a week over three years. You know, when I got into this industry, the first job I was doing, I was doing sessional training at the 2365 on a Tuesday and a Thursday evening. People would go to work. Then two evenings a week, they'd go to college for three yeah. years. 
you know and then during those three years they'd start taking on work and experience they may even change work during those three years but that's how it was done but people now are saying but people are now saying that's never been an option the only option is to go to six weeks of full-time training front load them then they're more valuable to employers but a lot of these people on these courses are messaging me saying yeah i've passed my exam but i was trained to pass my exam and then the next day we can't we forget that we've got we've got another exam this week so they shovel the information into past exams they get through their exams they force them to demonstrate the performance of it. I mean, Paul, you've seen the MVQ. Yeah, do this, take a picture, move on to the next outcome. This compression does not deliver experience. So people will still not get experience and they're still going to struggle. Yeah, the other thing about this, this whole domestic only thing where you're supposedly can only do that is there's a big danger there because if someone goes to someone's house and does some work and whatever, Oh, and they'll say, oh, while you're here, can you just look at my shop downstairs or something? And then, of course, mm. you're moving outside of that domestic only thing. And it's very easy to get tangled up in other stuff, which is not going to be covered on those sort of domestic type oh, courses. Yeah, you'll, 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 have, you'll have a guy who's only ever touched single phase and suddenly the landlord has a landlord cupboard with three phase or they'll be in a flat above a pub. Then they've got to go down to the pub. They'll, they'll fall in or trip over into commercial at some point. Yeah, and it's... <laughs> very very easy mm. which is fine if you know what you're doing with it but of course if you've never been taught any of that mm. and it wasn't covered on that course you went to well yeah. it's a complete fail isn't it so i think in summary just on part p i think part p was good in principle i think it stimulated interesting debate and i think it forced a lot of people to level up i think in summer i think it was good for the industry however i think nowadays it's horrifically abused and not with anything with good intentions has been contaminated and has become an enabling act for effectively the the rise of the short course which has now effectively become a cancer in our industry and doesn't allow the application of learning or skills over a period of time which is absolutely essential for confidence of the individual and development of competence of the individual um so part p there you go in a nutshell so we've also got moving on when we're still sticking to the theme of is the industry regulated we're trying to talk mm -hmm. around the topics here we have obviously electricity work regulations which if anybody goes onto the hsc website you will see lots and lots of case studies where people have been uh, prosecuted or injured or killed and it even breaks it down by the clauses of the electricity at work regulations lack of safe isolation safe system of work etc um, that's a secondary piece of law under the health and safety at work act um, I, I'm currently thinking the EAWR guidance may need an update based on the level of technology that we're implementing into houses. What do you think, Dave? John? I think, I think understanding that it's not just for electricians in principle, but the technology is also not just for electricians in principle. I think that there is some parts of it. I think the structure and the layout is fine, but there needs to be some additional bits put into it, if that makes sense. You know, the way it's the way the the way it's structured, I think works pretty well because it's very easy to identify each regulation and what each regulation does. The wording is good; it's not too complex. Bear in mind, I I deliver these to non-electrical clients, you know, aggregate companies, food manufacturers, and all these things. It's easy to translate. It's not too BS, not too technical language. As long as they keep it like that, and then bring some of our extra technology requirements in, I think it, that's what's needed. Yeah, what do you think, John? Yeah, I think so. It's and it, it, this all fits in with this idea about domestic work is some kind of sort of easy and trivial option to do uh, when it's not, and it's getting far more complex anyway. Just look at what people have in their homes now. There's this vast array of stuff which ten years ago didn't even exist. Um, so yeah, I think the the structure's okay, but there's a lot more stuff now which has got to be thought of and. Put in there basically don't disagree with you um also from an industry legal perspective i would say set of regulation or oversight yeah. for supply networks because the eawr applies to everybody whether you work for the dnos whether you're a trading electrician whether you're a house basher i know some people will say don't be stupid if you work in the house when you are there selecting and erecting the fixed installation as an electrical contractor mm. you're under the duress of the electricity work rigs once you're gone you're not that's Go. under the control of a normal person 
without going back too far, Paul, yeah. talking about electric, electrical safety first. Yeah. I um, I did a chalk. I, th I think it was I Ico with their with their, their channel. I did some talks yeah. with them about precedence, and I think the electricians. Um, there are many examples we think of regularly. We've got obviously. Uh, you know Emma Shaw you've got Mary Weary and then there's this, this poor young lad last year where the prosecution came through it's important that electricians during training and obviously going on through their main you know their professional careers hears about these situations so that we can keep assuring ourselves of the need to take this stuff seriously and I don't think our industry really can I mean we might get the news on a post from PE or Voltimum or so as news but I consider it a good like CPD for me to aw make myself aware of the consequence of neglect with electricity so that I can then help inform clients about the dangers and yeah. precedence is a key part of that. So when we talk about legislations, when there are court, you know, case studies and examples, we need to use those um, in some way as like a tool to help maintain that respect for what we're doing with electricity this is why i think i was probably ra rambling on about esf it'd be good if they put out monthly bar articles bulletins this okay. is what's happening in your industry from a prosecutions from a safety from a products perspective they can easily do it and that's that's where you're going to get to the coal face to the yeah. trading electricians who use the voltman resource and the pe resources and stuff um or even the facebook groups man if they're on facebook go onto the facebook uh, groups and do posts as ESF or whatever just put the facts out there and that's it and switch the comments off because obviously everybody will just in Facebook take the piss and find mm -hmm. some other fault um, but yeah that, that that's not a bad thing so moving forward to um, last year's debacle um, so if anybody gets a chance there is a a piece of legislation a statutory instrument called the electrical safety standards in private rented sector again mm. brought out because there was a need um, and it forced a lot of landlords to go out and get EICRs, which then created the knock on effect race to the bottom £35 EICR, yeah. which everybody then screamed out, why are the industry bodies not doing anything about this? Because they're not industry bodies. They're not regulating our industry. This is why I always say the industry isn't regulated. Because if it was, the likes of the NIC, the ECA, NAPIT and ESF all they've would done. say, don't accept this. Yeah, All they've done, unfortunately, is the strength of their brand and the industry's wish for them to take ownership of this to say to landlords make sure you use one of our registered people yeah which is all they've really done which isn't the point of it no it isn't and it's disgraceful and if anybody remembers or has the opportunity to get hold of the draft for public comment that one i think we went to town on that because that was full of some mm. horrific errors which kind of mandated that the installation would be must will basically fail unless it meets the latest edition of the wiring rigs and it was the first time ever in a piece of law that they actually defined an addition of the wiring regulations, which mm. for the purpose of that law effectively made the wiring regulations law, which mm. you're not supposed to do in statutory instruments. You're not supposed to do that at all. And mm. they threw the rules out. So whoever wrote this statutory instrument, which I've got a copy of here, and it's free to download, I would love to meet them and get them on this podcast to just understand their thinking when they wrote it. Um, but it has created a... I suppose it's it's been a revenue generator for the industry and like any good thing with good intent it's been yeah. probably taken in the wrong way and it's created a race to the bottom I've, yeah unfortunately I've, i heard i heard a lot of electricians say oh we've been overwhelmed with the icrs i'm fed up with doing them but we've got to do them and then they'll try and do as many as they can it's like oh, all we're doing really is losing the point losing the actual objective here if we're going to try just to get through them all but doing also it with the icrs dave the ICRs are peeling back many layers of an onion that I call the electrical industry. And there's mm. going to be a lot of tears involved. And also what it's showing is installations, whether they're new or old, there's some absolute dog's dinners out there. So, oh, so gotcha. when if, if anybody says, oh, the, 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 the defects in electrical installations because of the short course trained people, um, yes, potentially there is a contributory factor on new builds but uh, and, and the likes. But you we've got stuff going back decades that's lashed in and, poorly done by unskilled un you know uh, managed or instructed persons so it's it's nothing new so that piece of legislation if you work in the dwelling environment is something that you need to get uh, to know because it's something you could be prosecuted under um speaking of stuff you could be prosecuted under we did a podcast the other day where there was a chap 
prosecuted under the Consumer Protection from Unfair Trading Regulations 2008. And one of the chaps in our um, on our YouTube comments said um, also the Consumer Rights Act could have been prosecuted under, um, which was a very valid and I don't yeah. think anybody has, but it's a very valid point. It seems to be. It seems that we focus so much on the electrotechnical compliance, where we don't just think about the bigger picture. And it might be easier to convince the judge or similar of the bigger picture. Well, I'll read out you a know? comment from Mr. West. Um, it's worth mentioning this could have been prosecuted under the sale of goods, which also covers the sale of services, as extended out in '82. The legislation says should be taken out with reasonable skill and care, partly now replaced by the Consumer Rights Act. Um, yeah, I think it's I think it's a valid comment. So thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, I won't read out the whole comment. It's quite long, but mm. it's a very valid comment. And and so electricians now, you know, is the industry regulated? No, it, there's private for profit companies. However, you guys need to be aware, regardless of where you set foot during the day, is the AWR applying? Yes, always. Is the SQCR applying? Well, if it is, should you be even touching it um, and who you work for? But the Part P, the um, electrical safety standards in the private renting sec sector, they should go hand in hand. Consumer Rights Act, how you advertising and marketing yourself, consumer protection from fair trading for the CICR, that's now set a precedent. And a precedent in law means that it can be quoted again and again and again. And you probably won't get a judge going, well, that last judge was an idiot. No, because that's what they have the appeal process is no, for. So. At, at any point now, it just makes the job easier. Someone else has done the work to make that that first decision. You can just create. You know. John, what do you think of this electrical safety stands in the private rented sector? Obviously, well, it's minutes. another one of these things that the idea was OK, but the implementation of it just didn't work because it's it's now led this this whole industry of people rushing around and doing six or more EICRs in a day and there's actually companies advertising for this uh, which of course is impossible and so all you're getting is this this massive flood of people just going around there doing a five minute quick look round and saying yeah all is well here's a bit of paper so it, I don't think it's really achieved a great deal at all other than it's just got a load of bits of paper flying around that say yeah this installation is either part of a fine or some of the other extremes is where you've got people going in and just marking everything up as C1, saying this is dangerous, has to be replaced, rewire needed, give us 10 grand and we'll fix it all up for you. So, I mean, obviously there are people doing it properly in the middle somewhere, mm. but there do seem to be these two extremes of either it's just wonderful or it's just complete rewire required and to pay up or else. So, And it, and it gets harder and harder, John, as well, because I've heard of contracts where they go out and do like um, EICRs and the person doing the inspection will find c1s and c2s but the contract that they have won't allow the electrician to fix stuff there and then no which is insane and incompetent and and i would suggest criminally negligent of the employer and the contractor not discharging their duty of care to allow someone to walk away from and the, you know, the thing is this legislation stuff. came in with a deadline and that did push an awful lot i mean a lot of, an awful lot of people that do eicrs rapidly normally work on the basis of they'll run in, run out, they'll create remedials, and they'll make money on remedials. You know, I hate all that, but that's pretty much how a lot of them work. Now, when they've got hundreds of people calling up because they have, and then maybe leaving it till the last minute, they may not want the remedials done because they may not, they may want this passed now because of the deadline. So there may be many ICRs that have passed because they, you know, they phoned the electricians wanting you to pass my installation, where there may be some things that were actually C2s that should have been picked up, but they were just passed because I had to get through my number before this deadline that's come in. Yeah, and I you think know? it's also fair to say as well with, with regards to EICRs, our, 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 our brother, Mr. Dempsey, has spent many a night discussing some of his woes and challenges with some of the EICRs that he sees, because I think it's fair to say he has access to probably the largest repository in the UK of EICRs and some of the um, dog's dinners that he's seen. Mm -hmm. it, it, it paints an interesting picture, to be honest with you, of, you know, grab and run. Some companies don't want to do it. I have no problem if a contractor makes money from the defects they find. As long as they code them correctly, that I hopefully will, will remove risk. And that's the most important thing is, is people not getting hurt from all this electricery stuff. Mm -hmm. um, 
I'm going to move on, just on to Off Gem. Off Gem. So, anybody heard of Off Gem? You guys heard of them? Yeah, I'm assuming you have. I've heard John's, the name Off Gem. John's sitting there going, yeah. I've got several yeah. letters from them from when I burnt out the cable in my street <laughs> when I was doing some experiments. Um, but Off Gem, for anyone listening, is Britain's independent energy regulator. They work to protect energy consumers and especially vulnerable people. I'd like to know how by ensuring they are treated fairly and benefit from a cleaner, greener environment. Um, we are responsible for working with government, industry and consumer groups to deliver net zero economy. Uh, OK, what is net zero at the lowest cost to consumers? OK, so uh, do you know what? I, I'm going to go on a rant on this, I think. Stamping oh, out going. sharp and bad practice, ensuring fair treatment for all consumers, especially the vulnerable, enabling competition and innovation, which drives down price and results in new products and services. I'm sorry, but fluctuation of prices is it always comes down to greed. You know, if it's coal fired electricity, coal prices go up. That's what drives the cost up. Mm -hmm. It gets passed on to consumer. Um, I personally think the electrical industry should be government owned, run and managed. It is an essential service that should not be in the hands of for profit companies. Ofgem do have, um, believe it or not. So the DNOs, for instance, the DNOs have to report to Ofgem. And Ofgem actually do write guidance notes and materials, which we see in various connection uh, documents and et cetera. And Ofgem will even write to JPEL, our Warren Regs Committee. Now, they don't govern the electrical industry, but they're all we, if you were looking at a governing body of the electrical industry, I think Ofgem are all we've got. Yeah, maybe. Maybe I think I think that's all we've got. So they they operate a framework set by Parliament, which gives duties and powers to achieve objectives. I think they leave the low voltage our world alone mm. unless there's a change to the network distribution. And we even have got letters that have been published online because they have to be transparent because it's all taxpayer money um, where they've actually asked the wiring regulations committee to change certain criteria when they then change their like G12s and various other documents that they they help publish with uh, what they called Energy Networks Association. ENA, yeah. So yeah, they often work with the Energy Networks Association who write most of the DNO guidance. Then each individual DNO like Western Power will write their own version, which is interpret interpretation of ENA. But ENA effectively have a big functional collaborative working arrangement with Ofgem, effectively, because most of these industry bodies don't want to get their hands dirty. So they just create yeah. another sub body to do stuff. Henceforth, the chaos and confusion of how this industry is regulated. Yeah. Um, they only regulate just to just to quote them where necessary to protect consumers interests. And we carefully consider whether any regulatory requirement we propose is proportionate. We carry out investigations into company behavior when we believe they may have breached condition of their license. DNOs have an operating license. So, for instance, where the DNOs are saying we're not maintaining our earthing, you could, in theory, go to Ofgem and complain yeah. to Ofgem and complain. Yeah. But this and then is, Ofgem would give them a slap around the wrist. This is why you say you think it should be government owned, because once you start breaking it down and offering licenses out to people, these are paying for a license. And the last thing these companies want to do is then spend the money. They paid for the license. They don't want to spend the money to maintain the infrastructure, which they then may lose the license for. You know, so th they'll do the bare bone minimum to some degree. And try to just reap the reward of the license that they've paid for. You know, that's how many franchises work, to be fair. It does. Um, they're weirdly enough funded. We're governed, so they're governed. This is this gets even Off more jam. rabbit hole. Yeah. They're governed by the Gas and Electricity Markets Authority, which consists of non executive and executive members and a non exec chair. And they determine strategy, policies. Oh my God. It's just. Uh, do you remember the word quango? which yeah. was just a term the government used for an irrelevant, nonsensical department. I'm just seeing quangos now, but they use their powers are provided under the Gas Act 986, Electricity Act 1989, Utilities Act 2000, Competition Act 1998. Personally, I think Ofgem do more about just regulating the cost to consumers. Yeah, I think that's what they mainly do, but they can if they op issue the licenses and the licenses are obviously in compliance with ENA, then they can do more. But I don't think they do because Let's be honest about it. If you set up a for-profit company and call yourself an, a voluntary regulatory body, which is what they do call themselves, then this is as dumb as E5 saying, right, we're now a <laughs> re voluntary regulatory body. 
and convincing the government because if we convince the government we are a voluntary regulatory body and we'll get loads of heat and aggro off of them we'd probably be given a, a cps status which is what we discussed and we said we would never do because it was just it was just a why create another quango exactly doesn't make any sense but yeah so if you really have a firm complaint about a dno or, or something you want to get off your chest write it off gem it'd be really interesting to see the feedback that you get so just go on to the website and and See if you can get any joy out of Offgem. Um, I may actually include them in a letter that I'm writing at the moment to government. So, um, yeah, well, I'll let you know once I know once that's done. But um, yeah, so there you go. So that's Offgem. Um, guys, what are you taking away from this little chat about industry regulation? John, I'll start with you because you look confused. <laughs> well, it is confusing, isn't it? I mean, you've got you've got all of these organisations, all of which are sort of voluntary, optional, not compulsory most of which are all linked together in the background and to various complicated ways, which would take weeks to explain. And there's some good bits in there, but unfortunately there's also plenty of useless bits as well. So it's all as a bit of a mess. And in terms of overall regulation, well, there isn't any. Even things like Part P, it's not even compulsory. You don't have to belong to a scheme. You can just notify building control. And then the problem with there, of course, is if people don't notify stuff, who even knows? Who even cares? And even for other sectors, it's the same thing. It's not, there's no overall, you will do this, you've got to do that. It's just that some people do this, some people do that, other people don't do anything. It's all a bit of a mess. That's going on a t-shirt somewhere. <laughs> Fantastic quote, John. Um, Mr. Watts, what's your view on this? It's as John says, it's confusing. It's hard to understand where the decisions are made that end up down the line to the people we need to impress, who we need to comply with, because we feel we need to have their authorization for us to work, which is what has been, in, you know, that's that's the effort. The effort has been made to make customers and clients think that badges are necessary for us to be considered suitable um this this may all change in the next two or three years the attitude the cultures may change there may be something new maybe something different maybe a new new identity maybe a new badge, new brand new badge new new name whatever but the legislations are always going to be there and i think the best efforts will be to go to the legislation see what the legislations say maybe look at the different regulators the voluntary bodies and all this and look at their interpretations what they expect you to do to perform but always make sure that you go to the legislations and then whatever regulation comes into you or comes upon you, you can pretty much be confident that you've already followed the thread that they are going to ask you to do. Because everything will go to a legislation at some point. Yeah. Um, so put the effort in that. Look at the legislations, follow the thread. Um, and by all means, you can then just look at your local regulations and standards and stuff and put the effort in there. Uh, trying to always keep an eye on what one body is doing compared to another, unless they clear up and make it easier or just take ownership, licensing or whatever. For now, it's a case of, well, you know, what do you want me to do this year? Because next year you may say something different. And it's exhausting. It is exhausting. It's exhausting trying to know what, you know, and bear in mind that some of these organisations, they'll have one person come to you who will have a different opinion expectation than the other person. You know, which we hear a lot. We hear a lot about that kind of thing. So, you know, just believe in yourself, follow the legislations, tie yourself up, and don't worry about what they think. Um, and then that's what I put and More importantly, do, do, if you're interested in this, do your own research as well. Yeah, exactly. Because we, 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 have, we, have, we, have, we as a team have been researching this for years now, um, and it's always changing and it's always fluctuating. And I'm going to give a shout out now um, to what I call the E5 originals before E5 existed, uh, a chap called Mr. Pete Morris. Um, a, a chap called Mr. Andy Kidd and Phil Watts, your dad, mm -hmm. um, because back in the days of Part P and, and, and all that, um, what you will watch, and I highly recommend if you go onto the Sparky Ninja's channel, you'll see videos from the um, Parliament TV where you'll see our industry bodies talking to MPs about what they're doing. And you might see one chap in the background shaking <laughs> his head um, and in more recent videos wearing an E5 badge. Um, so that's Mr. Pete Morris, who attended all of the um, committee mm -hmm. hearings. My dad um, sat on one of them as well. Yes, your dad sat on one of them. 
Yeah. And these guys have been questioning in an independent manner the industry for many, many, many years. Um, they're a little bit older now, so they've kind of taken a back step. But I'd like to just tip my cap to them, really, and thank them for everything they've done in this podcast, to be honest with you. Um, moving on, before we wrap this up, I have a hope and a dream. Um, I, um, I'm going to talk about the EngTech Elect stuff, the IET are doing. Okay. Um, these are the soundbite bits that they'll probably listen to. So um, the EngTech Elect program is something that the IET have got as a electrician exclusive route into IET membership. Um, as we know, Mr. Dempsey was the, um, if we go back years. eight, nine years, the first mm. time I met Mr. Dempsey was the birth of the EngTech Elect um, idea. It came from Mr. Dempsey's head and it was a very collaborative piece of work. And I remember really enjoying doing it and absolutely loving Mr. Dempsey's passion and everything else for it. Um, I would love the EngTech Elect program to succeed and become something that helps regulate our industry better. Um, time is yet to tell, is all I'll say on that. Um, it's still a work in progress, so we'll see where that fits into the, uh, the ether of things. Mm -hmm. I, I've always said that what's in your heart and your mind uh, are the two things that will steer your ship. So um, other than that, lads, unless you've got any other final thoughts, we'll finish it here. Uh, I'll I'll give a, a mention of something that's been good this week as well. One of um, positives, yes, go yes, for it. positives. Uh, TESP, the Electrotechnical Skills Partnership, has released another great bit of media um, challenging training providers. The uh, the uh, Rogue Trainers campaign, brilliant, Try, and it's got these red flags and all these things just starting to really point at training providers that create training courses out of short courses. Short courses are built to provide further development to <clears throat> persons who have already done apprenticeships or four or five years of training. They're there for extra, you know, yeah. extra learning, extra development. They're not there as a pick and mix for you to create a structure course and thrash around people to then pass exams. And then you've got this pile of certificates at the end of it. So they've got all these little things throwing in. It's a great campaign. Um, it they is. are a industry partner of the ECA. So this is this this is where I think about good things coming from the work that ECA and their partners are doing. Yep. Um, if they're going to put out these messages, I will do nothing but repeat those messages, support them and back them. Because yep. if, the, if the attitude is to get back to doing proper training, proper routes to industry, the electrical careers website that they also run, uh, it's all in the right direction. It's very positive. Um, yeah, gives me a nice, so, funny, warm feeling inside. It's very nice. I think uh, you're right. And I've shared it on Instagram. And I think mm. so. Industry body of the year for 2021. Tesp. Well done. Hats off. Brilliant. It's brilliant. I love the campaign. And, and it's almost like they just put a listening device in Dave's studio in my head. <laughs> and just downloaded him. Yes. Because that, that video, the minute I saw it, I just went, oh, my God, Dave's going to be so happy. Dave's going to have like a Christmas New Year Eve party with that just playing on repeat. Because, yeah, no, it, it's a small step. I shared it and without without trying to get on the soapbox, I shared it. I shared it on Instagram. I put it on TikTok, I put it on YouTube, I put it on Twitter. Yeah. I've written a blog about it. I've not seen another training provider even mention it. You know, isn't that insane? It's weird. I mean, Professional Electrician Magazine, they've shared it. I'm sure Volta may have shared it. People in the campaign have shared it. Oh. Other, tra other training providers, no. And I'm not accusing every training provider of being bad, by the way. There's no, some very, but, very good ones. But you know but what I, I say about that? I want, I want us all to try to I want us all to try to shout out about better training so the people who are trying to get into this industry, instead of spending seven thousand pounds to a third party that's going to send you books and then rely on you to read them from home to then go to another company for training or just pass exam sessions. I want you to just have the opportunity to do it properly. And TESP is the best resource right now for this information. I agree. And as I said a minute ago, um, and you know, I always say silence is the sound of the guilty. Mm, maybe. So there you go. John, final thoughts. Yeah, I mean, wherever the industries are going to end up going, whether that's some kind of licensing thing or whatever it is, the important thing is that in terms of the electrical industry, it's not sort of a destination. You don't go to a place, do a course, and then it's all fixed forever. It's a mm. permanent, ongoing thing, and that's got to be part of whatever some end solution has got to be. So you don't have, because if you just make something that's going to be, oh, here's a set of criteria, all that will happen is it's happened already, 
magic training courses will appear that will meet those criteria just about and then you'll have people going to them doing that thinking oh yeah we've got all our bits of paper that's fine for the next 50 years so it's got to be something where it's ongoing training mm. development whatever else it is forever so if you're going to work in the extra industry say 50 years that 50 years is spent continuously developing improving learning new stuff keeping up to date with everything and there's got to be something in place to make sure that that is actually being done if there's going to be some sort of license or something along those lines put in place. That's as magical as anything you've ever said, John. God bless you. It's music to my I can't I can't top that. I'm not even gonna bother. No, I just feel like Dave, it's in my head again. Dave, just don't perfect. say anything. And on that bombshell, we're gonna end this now. Um so to everyone listening, watching, thank you very much. John is a legend. Until <laughs> the next one, whenever that is, take care of yourself and each other. Bye bye. 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 Hell, John, that was amazing. That's like poetry. You were always. That was like that was yeah. like listening to Barry White read the regulations. Paul.